Good afternoon. Welcome back to Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Walker, Chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. This will be another in our uh, long series of COVID uh, Grand Rounds. Um, we're now down to doing them once a month. I had once uh, uh, said that we'll stop doing them. It was about a year ago, and that, of course, was ridiculous. So I won't say anything about when this might stop. Uh, we'll certainly continue them for at least the next several months. In fact, uh, you might want to mark on your calendar. The next one uh, will be April 7th, and the speakers will be Caitlin Rivers, who's uh, helping to lead a new center at the CDC for uh, uh, forecasting and projecting pandemics, as well as Zika Manuel from, uh, from Penn, who's really been a national leader in driving the system forward uh, in COVID planning. We'll talk about one of the uh, elements of that today. Uh, it was uh, just about two years ago that we held the first one of these sessions, and I just went back onto YouTube and looked at it, and I was uh, impressed by how little we knew and how scared we all were. It's really quite striking to watch it. Uh, we've clearly entered a new stage. If you watch the State of the Union and saw uh, pretty much no masks, uh, it was clear that something was very, very different. Case and hospitalization rates continue to plummet. Uh, we're so used to surprises that, uh, to me, one of the most surprising things about the last couple of months has been how few surprises there have been. Once we sorted out the nature of Omicron and how infectious it was and immune resistant and, uh, and that it was a little bit less severe, um, and once we saw the curve in South Africa come up and come down fast, uh, that's what we thought might happen over the, over the subsequent two months in the U.S., and that's precisely what has happened. Um, and, uh, and so that in many ways has been quite reassuring. We clearly entered a much more benign phase and it's much easier to enter a more benign phase than a more serious phase, uh, but it has its own challenges. Our brains have been pickled in anxiety for two years and they don't stop, uh, snap back into uh, regular mode all that easily. There's still a, a danger mode that I think is still in many of our heads. And we've come to appreciate there's no real bright line between safe and not safe. They're all relative, and there are still some lingering uncertainties as we look at waning efficacy of vaccines and waning in, uh, immunity from natural infection, uh, the prospect of new variants, uh, the, uh, what the long-term outcomes are for people with COVID. Those are a lot of things that kind of linger in, uh, in the background. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The second half of our session will be focused on vaccines, and Bonnie Maldonado from Stanford will come in and talk to us about that. I'll introduce her uh, when it's time for that. The first half will be a discussion with two of our favorite uh, UCSF experts to join us, uh, talking broadly about a lot of different issues uh, in the current stage. So introduce them uh, briefly to you. You know them uh, quite well by now. Peter Chin Hong is professor of medicine in the Division of, uh, Division of Infectious Diseases based at UCSF Health. He's also the associate dean for our regional campuses. Uh, he's a medical educator who specializes in treating infectious diseases, particularly those in immunosuppressed hosts. And uh, he has been a go-to uh, expert for many of us and local and national media uh, since this thing started, as has our second guest, who is Monica Gandhi, who is Professor of Medicine, Associate Division Chief for Clinical Operations and Education in the Division of HIV, Infectious Diseases, and Global Medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. She also serves as the Director of the UCSF and Gladstone Center for AIDS Research and the Medical Director of the HIV Clinic. Um, and as I think everybody knows, she's been a prolific communicator uh, with the media, social media, and in lay and medical journals on many of the key issues over the course of the last couple of years. So uh, thank you both for coming on today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Let's start uh, kind of open-ended. Uh, tell us how you see where we are today, the state, the state of the pandemic uh, as, as we think about things today. So Peter, why don't we start with you? So I think um, my feeling is probably mired or um, confirmed by the public opinion polls, which is this weird mix of anxiety and also um, you know, feeling fed up and ready to move on. So if you look at the polls, uh, I think 65% or 61% of people from a Kaiser Family Foundation poll still feel worried about spreading infection to particularly immunocompromised people, yet 65% of the same people say, well, I'm ready to move on, open up the economy, and I'm worried about uh, the mental health tool of masks in school. So kind of a mix, and that's kind of where I sit as well. I'm embracing life zestfully, but trying to be as responsible as possible. 
Okay, and we'll get to what that means in a second. Do you think that the the um, uh, new moves and the, the, the ends of mandates and 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 the new recommendations from CDC are driven by uh, are they justified by the state of the pandemic in terms of the case rates and the threat, or do you think they are largely driven by the fact that everybody has said I want <laughs> I want to move on? I think the answer, like everything in medicine, is yes and yes. Um, I think there has been a lot of public pressure. And to me, and I, I think this is where um, Monica's uh, been all along, is that there's been a lot of uh, mixed messaging still even in this transition zone. And people have been confused. So you have the CDC saying one thing, the state saying another thing, and county saying another thing. And what you see over time is people becoming aligned. So that I think is more unsettling to people in the community, but there's still a lot of that discomfort because Omicron is going on so quickly. People haven't had time to hem and haw over the data. Um, CDC is usually very react, uh, you know, reactive to the data that we have right now. And a lot of these sort of state, et cetera, are looking at projections. So they're being proactive and seeing where we might be in a certain time. Okay. Monica, why don't you give us your broad take on where we are today? Well, yeah, I mean, one thing is in terms of the mask guidance, you know, I just want to remind us all why we did any of our non-pharmaceutical interventions while we were waiting for the pharmaceutical interventions, which are vaccinations and therapeutics. And the NPIs, including masks and lockdowns and capacity limits and everything else, were meant to actually keep our hospitals able to take care of patients with COVID. And so linking NPIs, in this case, mask wearing, with hospitalization metrics, I think made perfect sense. Um, because a case does not mean a case like it did before. When someone is vaccinated, having some COVID in your nose is simply not the same thing um, as when, when we could get really sick before the vaccine. Um, in terms of where we are now, actually, um, I, someone asked me, well, don't you think we're going back to normal too soon? And I feel like uh, President Biden actually um, set the right tone in the State of the Union address, which he, he said, no, it's not that we're living with COVID. What we are doing is now we have the tools, which are really vaccines and therapeutics. We can say school closures, business closures um, were something that we had to do at the beginning. I will say that I think the collateral damage of those and two years in, you know, are, are pretty clear, especially the school closures. But it's not, you have to reframe that discussion about saying, oh, are we just rushing back to normal too soon? I reframe it as saying, we got amazing vaccines, we decided who needed boosters. Maybe we gave them to everyone and maybe they didn't all need it, but that's okay. We, get, we gave boosters. We have fourth boosters for some and we have therapeutics. And that really changed it for me because we have not just the monoclonal antibodies that can protect someone like my father who's 87 and getting chemo right now. He got a long acting six months um, EVU shelled, but we also have Paxlovid, which is an oral pill, five days. And I really love the plan. I know we'll talk about it yesterday, but I really like the, the innovative ideas of getting our immunocompromised and vulnerable patients taken care of. So that when you say immunocompromised, we have the specific groups that we know are immunocompromised and how we can take care of them with treatments. So let's stick with you for a second, because I know you helped advise uh, the White House on their latest plan. Uh, without going into great detail about all of its elements that take too long, but just give us your your 30,000 foot view of the, the plan. You know, there was some criticism, including from Zika Manuel, who led this, uh, who will be our guest next month, saying that the White House a month, uh, as of two or three months ago, was just too focused on vaccines and not pivoting to the long game here. Do you think they have, and do you think that plan gets it right? Yes, I think it now does with the impetus with the incomplete putting in of the therapeutics. So it's a four point plan and it's essentially vaccinations and figuring out who needs boosters and which vaccines we'll need in the future. The second is um, the test to treat program, which is really that if you need therapeutics because there's gonna be two groups who won't respond beautifully to the vaccines, one is those who won't get vaccinated. Um, and the second, so we've declined vaccination. And the second is those mostly with B-cell depleting therapies and solid organ transplants, that's what a CID article showed us last week, the, the least likely to respond to the vaccines as well. They need protection. And so what test to treat is, is literally who knows better about drug-drug interactions than pharmacists, having tests 
and the treatment at pharmacies. You can go to a pharmacy if you suspect that you are uh, been exposed to COVID, you can get tested. And if you're immunocompromised, you get the five-day course of Paxlovid. Reminds me of rapid treatment for HIV. It's so innovative. I thought that was great. The third is going back um, to businesses and recovery. And I think any pandemic plan has to have a pandemic recovery component. Um, and in included in that fourth part is wastewater surveillance so that we know at any point if, because we're not gonna be tracking cases, probably not telling the public all the cases uh, at a certain point in time, like we don't do for flu, but at any point, if the cases start going up, six a days at least ahead of time, you'll be able to know from wastewater surveillance if there's a new variant. And then the last part of the plan is vaccinating the world. And we can say, oh, well, everyone has natural immunity from Omicron. Well, I think that's true in Africa, um, the continent in general has gone to endemic management, but I do think that we're gonna need, especially for older people, one vaccine dose after natural immunity, uh, uh, Africans, Asians, anyone who hasn't gotten the vaccine, at least older people are gonna need one vaccine dose to give them that hybrid immunity. So vaccinating the world is tremendously important. Great, thank you. Uh, Peter, why don't you give us your take on, on the plan and which elements you thought were, you know, were sort of novel and interesting and moving us in the right direction? Yeah, so 30,000 foot view for me, um, and Monica laid it out beautifully, was the fact that we're not putting all of our eggs in the vaccine basket. It's multimodal, um, the emphasis on test and treat, which I love, uh, but also, and also there are lots of other minor things to like, you know, thinking about the physical plant and ventilation and uh, all of those other thorny issues that would serve us be well beyond sort of like COVID itself. But some of the, I guess one of the, uh, the aspects I can think about are some of the potential uh, uh, questions I have, which is really about money. It doesn't everything come down to money? So $30 billion is not chum change. And to you know, you'd have to convince uh, Congress and lawmakers to fund this. And some people think you actually need like $100 billion. So it, prevention is always never sexy. Um, again, you, it's easy to, to throw money when a lot of people are, are really ill uh, at the moment, but uh, you know, our country hasn't always been great about thinking about the future. So that's the worry. And of course, um, pharmacists are great and expert as Monica has pointed out with drug interactions, but you need to know what people's drugs are in the first place. And because we don't have a national health system and a national uh, electronic health record, I, you know, for many people, particularly those who don't access care very easily or have patchwork care, you know, if you're on that Coumadin, if you're on that, um, you know, uh, uh, drug that interacts, uh, you'd have to kind of uh, think about that. And, and so the devil's always in details, but I love the idea. I love the multimodal approach and hopefully we'll get the, the money uh, to go along with the plan. Do you think, is there enough, I mean, it seems like a, there are a lot of different therapeutics, uh, you know, once you have COVID monoclonals and the Merck drug and uh, remdesivir, but it seems like most of the money here is with the Pfizer drug, uh, Paxlovid. Um, is there enough of it now? It sounds like, you know, as Monica was describing, you know, it is one of the key things that's different that now if you do get COVID and you're at high risk, you can go ahead and get started on this drug. But is there enough of it? You have immunosuppressed patients. Are you able to get them on this drug? I always get asked that question. And the answer is uh, there is enough of it for the people who know about it. Um, but there are vast swaths of people and clinicians who don't really know how to access it. It's still very clunky. I still have to go to our like sort of like SOP to figure out which pharmacy will give it. You know, I still have to call the pharmacist figure out and if I'm doing that, I can't imagine what other people are doing in the community. I think part of the plan is not only to have tests and treat, but to have an information blitz and let people know about it. Because right now it's kind of been like kind of on a down low, mainly because we haven't had as many supplies. People are trying to figure out uh, how to use it. Um, but they did ask for a billion uh, additional doses from the manufacturer, uh, which is like several times our population. So I think that if that comes true, uh, it will be golden. But right now we're still in the ramp up phase on mon multiple fronts, uh, particularly uh, regarding infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, Monica, you've written about that mandates should go away and should never come back. And maybe I'm misquoting you, but let's first of all be sure that that is what you say. What, you know, we're entering this new phase. The mandates are going away. A lot of the the push now is on personal choice. If you want to wear a mask, you can, and uh, all that. But as you mentioned, there are going to be surveillance systems that signal that the wastewater shows there's a new surge coming, or the hospitalization is are, are beginning to pick up. Are you saying that mandates are not appropriate in, in, in the setting of a new surge? Or maybe just describe sort of how you feel about mandates. Obviously not now, but for a coming world where we might see new surges. Yes. So um, I think there are just two mandates to discuss, actually, mask mandates and vaccine mandates. So vaccine mandates, um, I really actually believe in. And I don't, I'm, it's, it's pretty hard for an infectious disease doctor to not think that um, we need vaccine mandates. And in fact, I will say that we tried to have a session at our recent ID conference on vaccine mandates and we couldn't, we couldn't have anyone, couldn't find anyone to argue the other side. Um, but I do not believe in uh, firing people if they don't get the vaccine or not letting them go to school. So I think that you have to have some sort of um, kind of life is inconvenient, testing, some, some other way. But I think firing people uh, was a particular harshness uh, that I that I would not have done as a society uh, because people need their jobs. Um, so mask mandates is really all we're talking about. So um, yeah, I did write a lot about masks, and in fact, uh, my division chief and I wrote one of the first uh, papers calling for universal masking before the April third, twenty twenty CDC guidance came out, um, which was saying everyone should universally mask. So. Um, so we had that in before. Now, the thing about the word mask is there's just simply no doubt that we have a lot more data on masks now. And it really matters what mask you wear. And there is no doubt, because I can see the questions in the chat, that we have been asking children in schools essentially to cover their faces with the wrong mask for two years. Now, I've come on this grand rounds and talked about cloth masks before as decreasing severity of disease. And I think they did. In fact, the NIH picked up on our study and they did a study that said it's probably the humidification of air in the back of the throat that when you're wearing a mask that led to less severe disease. But I'm sorry, what's the best way to reduce severity of disease? Get vaccinated. And so um, at this point, a cloth mask is not actually decreasing exposure or transmission. And in fact, there was a CDC study on February 11th that looked at different types of masks in indoor settings. And they said cloth masks reduced by 56%. And they even had a little graphic and then you go to the paper and the, um, there was no statistical significance to that finding. So it really is N95s, KN95s, FFP2s, KF94s, which actually work for little faces, uh, double mask um, uh, with cloth and surgical or a cloth with a filter inside. It has to be one of those six masks. So going forward, are we going to mandate the population wear those type of specific masks or not? Well, I will say that there's been some good studies, including one we tried to, to conduct ourselves using very sophisticated analyses and mask mandates didn't really change anything. And I'm sorry to bring up the Saturday Night Live episode from, um, from a Saturday night, but, um, but it is true. And that's probably because people wear them differently. They wear the wrong kinds of masks. They may be distancing more, being more careful if they want to wear a mask. And so we have to either be clean about our recommendations and say, going forward, you have to wear these right types of masks. And I'm going to let you choose if you wear them, because there are some people who are much less at risk for COVID, including children, um, or someone who is vaccinated and boosted. And I'm going to let you choose versus not let you choose. I'm going to let, uh, it's going to be mask optional, and these are the right types of masks. And I do think that's what the CDC is going to do next year. And I think they should do it every respiratory pathogen season. My father is never going to be indoors without a mask every respiratory pathogen season. He just is going through chemo right now. But I don't know if it's going to be a mandate. And, and if it's going to be a mandate, we better make it the right type of mask or we're going to lose. The loss of public health trust during this time, especially around masks, was not worth, I think, what we did. So let me just see if I understand that. So you, you feel like if there is a mandate, it should be a mandate of masks that we know work, which are, are N95s or six, equivalent yeah. in, in, in some way. But your feeling is that mandates are not worth the sort of political blowback or 
because I'm envisioning a world where let's say there's a new variant or let's say we have a big Omicron surge next winter. And um, I guess you could say no mandate, but, you know, we encourage people to wear good masks. And we believe that even if people around you are not wearing masks, if you're wearing a good mask and you've got three it shots, you're quite you. well protected. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you could also say, you know, at this point to try to protect the community, there's a there's a communal interest in having everybody mask and not having it be an individual choice. You would not favor in the setting of a new surge or a new variant. You would not favor there being a mandate, uh, but leave it up to individuals. I think the problem is, yes, I favor vaccine mandates over mask mandates. And um, the reason that I'm more concerned about mask mandates is it's not the political blowback. It's actually the data that's accrued over the last two years that have said it is specific type of masks and, um, and that people are of variable risks from COVID-19 when they've had vaccines and boosters. And that of all the things that we've asked people to do during this time, getting a vaccine really protects you, but masks are not exactly um, great for communication, for like pe making people feel normal, making people feel that they're like, you know, um, it, that there are other harms of masking that have been recorded in the healthcare worker field, in the school field, communications, healthcare worker field. There's a big paper that just came out that people don't want to see their healthcare workers in masks um, because they- So like, are, you, they, are, you, they are you saying no, face. are you saying no mandates even in healthcare? I think that has to be based on a community transmission rate as opposed to a hospital transmission, a hospital metric like we do for the public, because we are healthcare workers, we have to ensure that we have very low rates of COVID before we unmask. Okay, Peter, let me, I, I want to make sure we get to two or three other quick questions. So Peter, what, why don't you just weigh in on the mandate issue? Um, I agree that vaccines trump masks, but I worry that people see no mandate, but we have to be very clear about communication. I agree with Monica. But no mandate doesn't mean you don't wear a mask. So I'm, I want to make sure that people know that. And if anything we're left with at the end of the pandemic or as the pandemic wanes currently, um, that is still good to wear a mask uh, in multiple settings, uh, including during respiratory virus season. You know, I've probably gotten one cold uh, in the last two years, which is like a record for me. And, you know, we've all seen the curves of influenza. So they have other benefits. But again, if I had to choose one thing, it would be vaccine, vaccine, and vaccine. Uh, above one that. thing I would want to say is that places that have not had mandates, but have recommended masks, have actually had good mask wearing behavior. So I have, a, uh, I have parents in a red state and um, very good when they drop mandates, people really still wanted to wear the masks and especially those at risk. So I do think that, that you have to decide what you make a population do or just recommend with the idea that people want to be safe and they want to protect themselves. Okay. Uh, let's do a couple other quick ones. Uh, long COVID uh, study came out a couple of weeks ago that was not so much about the symptoms of long COVID, but the possibility that it increases long-term risks of bad cardiovascular outcomes. So how do you interpret that? And, and, and how do you think about long COVID in your decision-making about what kind of risk you or your patients are going to bear. Uh, you know, as we think about sort of a more benign infection, there's this sort of issue of lingering possibilities of, 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 of uh, consequences from COVID that you have to weigh as well. So Peter, how do you think about that? Well, I, I come back to the, the other study that we've seen um, recently, which, you know, long COVID is, and chronic symptoms uh, is modified by four things. Um, the amount of virus in your blood, yeah, and then some other things like EBV reactivation and diabetes and autoantibodies. But the most compelling thing to me is, are you getting it in the bloodstream, the virus in the bloodstream? So the things that don't get the virus in the bloodstream uh, is a talking point that I sometimes think about. So therefore, coming back to the whole oral therapies, uh, you treat early, you reduce the amount of virus in your bloodstream, you vaccinate, you reduce the chances that you'd get the virus inside of you as a way to think about uh, whether or not people have uh, chronic symptoms uh, after COVID. So, you know, we've been seeing so many weird sort of sequelae with chronic symptoms, including yesterday, the study of three uh, monkeys with um, testicular and, and prostate, uh, <laughs> COVID, which made me feel particularly queasy. So I think that, um, you know, more reasons to think about uh, vaccines and early therapy to try to 
reduce the chances of that virus getting into the bloodstream. Okay. So it does sound like your feeling is the, that availability of Paxlovid to get on it quickly may be an important adjunct in terms of decreasing the probability of long-term bad outcomes. Monica, anything to add? Yes, I mean, I think um, Peter has exactly right. There are two actually pathophysiologic mechanisms for uh, longer symptoms after. One is, like you said, Peter, having the virus get into the bloodstream, which was more associated with severe disease and what void of vaccines work to reduce our chance of severe disease. Um, and then the second is um, actually um, kind of an inflammatory response that's more nonspecific. And what vaccines do is they make our immune response really specific and adapted and directed across the virus. So there was that large Israeli study um, that looked at really the right control groups because you need control groups. So the control groups were people who were vaccinated, people who were non-vaccinated, um, and then people who had never had COVID at all. And what vaccination did, and then you had a mild breakthrough after vaccination, is you had the same long COVID symptoms as if you had never seen the virus at all and much lower than unvaccinated. So the same number. So what that means is I would always if when I'm going to tell people about the vaccines, I'm going to say they do two things. They reduce severe disease, which is why we notice COVID to begin with. And they also seem to remove the possibility of long COVID, at least in the largest study we have. Okay, great. Uh, Bonnie's here. So on a last question for both of you, um, the, the authorities now tell us you, let's say they tell us pretty soon that you don't have to wear a mask anywhere. Uh, and I'm assuming you've both had three shots. So tell me, are you not wearing a mask anywhere or are you wearing a mask somewhere? And if so, where is where are those places? So Monica, why don't you go first? Okay, well, I'm gonna be different than Peter because um, I also have not had a cold for two years, but um, I was part of a project called the NIH Microbiome Project. And, uh, and um, the last meeting was in 2019. And we really do need to have some exposure to pathogens, sorry, for our immune diversity. So our masks are screwing up our, our microbiomes? Is that they, the deal here? They actually are. And, and oh especially goodness. for children, because this is a time, you know, there's autoimmune diseases, unfortunately cancer, and also, um, allergies that are higher. This is the hygiene hypothesis, but they really do need to see pathogens, little children, sorry, um, to get more immune diversity. And so um, I have, I will wear it at work until uh, the community transmission is low. And I think we're all going to be allowed to drop it, but I'm not going to be wearing masks um, inside because I kind of want a cold at some point because I really need immune diversity. And so do my children. My older father with chemotherapy, he cannot wear, he has to wear a mask. So it's going to be wrist stratification. You wear a mask around your father? Um, well, I just went and saw him last week, but we are all three vaccinated, boosted, and he's on Evusheld because he's getting, he's getting chemotherapy. So I didn't know. Okay. And when you go into the Safeway and you not, you don't need to talk to anybody. In fact, you don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> uh, and you're going to be there for 20 minutes. Your, your choice is to be without a mask. Correct. And with my children to her low risk as well, and they're vaccinated. Okay, Peter? Yes, as Monica predicted, I'm a slightly different take. I think <laughs> plenty I, of- I could have guessed that as well. Yeah, yeah go I, ahead. I'm getting plenty of exposure to help my microbiome <laughs> in other parts. And it's not Ooh, like- Ooh, I'd like to know more about And like wearing a mask everywhere, but if it's crowded indoors, I just get nervous and I'm not gonna think that I'm gonna have efficacy by holding my breath like the air mayor of uh, LA. Uh, by not getting things. So when it's crowded indoors and duration matters too, luckily uh, I don't live with any immunocompromised individuals so I don't have to worry about bringing it home. Yep. So, um, but I, I think in my daily activities outside of going to Safeway, I'm probably uh, well equipped to get to restore my microbiome. But, so, but I, I totally hear where Monica- What are you doing with yeah. other ways? So to, to tell, to, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go there. Just no, no, in no, terms no. of you go shopping, you're wearing a mask. Are you going to restaurants? I'm going to restaurants. I have no problems going to restaurants. So I, obviously you take I your walk, mask off. And I walk in with the check-in with a bunch of people and I keep it on. Yeah. But it's like very instantly. And then I go into the seat and I sit down and I have no problems taking my mask off. So, okay. um, you know, that's kind of where I am right now. Yeah, that makes sense. I think our vaccines work so beautifully. Just everyone should know that. All right. Well, we'll hear more perfect segue, Monica. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Let me let both of you go. Thank you. Fascinating. I'm glad. Always nice to have a little contrasting views. And uh, I think it helps to educate all of us. 
Thank, thank you. you both. So uh, let's move on. And we obviously talked a little bit about vaccines, but we're going to spend the last half hour talking just about vaccines. Our guest, and thank you for coming, is uh, Bonnie Maldonado, who's professor in chief of the Division of Infectious Disease in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford. She's also senior associate dean for faculty development and diversity at Stanford. Uh, the School of Medicine during COVID, she's led a number of studies, clinical and epi studies and modeling and other aspects of the pandemic. And she's really uh, emerged as a, a national and world leader in understanding the role of vaccines. And she is chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases and is a liaison to the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. She's uh, incredibly well published in the area. So we're privileged to have you, Bunny. Thank you for being here. And I think we're gonna do this with you starting with a short talk and then we'll do a Q&A after that. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did get a chance there. Unfortunately, I didn't hear the whole conversation, but I love the repartee there. And I do think one of the issues that comes up very clearly and we'll, we'll see with vaccines as well is this is a lot of this is about risk perception and uh, and you know how risk averse or how risk uh, how 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 much we value how we interpret the same data and uh, decide to make our decisions based on our own uh, understanding of risk. So uh, I'm going to talk, as you heard, about um, vaccines primarily. I'm going to talk a little bit about boosters in children since I'm a pediatrician. Uh, and thank you, by the way, for inviting me, Bob. And great to be on with you, uh, Monica and Peter. So uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm also on, a, on the DSMB for the NIH, uh, NIID Active 2 and 3 trial. So uh, along with Paul Volberdin, we've been uh, reviewing some of the antiviral and other uh, therapies uh, that are funded by NIH. And I work with Pfizer on some of some uh, two vaccine trials. So I think you all know these data already, but I think it's important just to give you an overview because not only are we seeing the, the adult data here on the left, but you can see, I'm sorry, and see on the right-hand side here, the scale of course is different, but you can see that um, the number of cases in the US really did um, affect, uh, the, the Omicron variant really did affect pediatric cases as well. You can see that in one week alone in the middle of January, we had reported across the country over a million children infected. So clearly um, it, uh, Omicron affected children. And I say that because many people have uh, this, there's this uh, underlying um, uh, uh, narrative that children don't get infected and they don't get sick. Now children have made up about 20 to 25% of cases over time. But you, you can see that we're well on our way down from the surge. I hope we're in a sweet spot now as you probably already discussed. Um, when we look at vaccinations, you can see, which I think is really striking, that we have actually over half a, bill, uh, half a billion doses of vaccine administered in the U.S. so far, which is really astounding. It's a stunning number. And probably in the history of vaccinations, we've never seen this many vaccines, not just in the U.S., but around the world, given to people and followed for safety and efficacy and effectiveness. And you see, of course, as the ages go up that as, as many as 95% of people over, age, uh, over the age of 65 have been vaccinated. This will come back in a bit. Now, the situation for children, and unfortunately the data are updated every Thursday, so I didn't have a chance to update it this morning, um, but this is from the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics website. And you can see that unfortunately we're not doing the same uh, with children ages five to 11, which uh, we'll hear more about later. We um, approved vaccines for five to 11 year olds under EUA in November, and only 25% of kids in that age group have yet been vaccinated, and only about 57% of 12 to 17 year olds have been vaccinated uh, so far. And you can see here on the left, um, the trajectory of vaccinations, cumulative at the top, and then over time um, as well on the right and then the bottom left. And you see that we are just starting to taper down our, our vaccinations in kids. And over on the right, this is data from a MMWR, but I like the way the Washington Post put the slide together. Um, you can see seroprevalence over time. This was just reported a few days ago. Um, and this is from national data from uh, seroprevalence studies at CDC. 58% of children have uh, been infected with COVID um, based on N-protein uh, serology. 
And you can see that the, uh, uh, that the age uh, is inversely proportional to how quickly people were vaccinated in the US. So clearly it, it, it you know, obviously we, I can't prove this, but it does seem to be associated with risk of, um, of actual infection is um, inversely proportional to who was most likely to be vaccinated over the course of the pandemic. Now, I'm gonna go back to a study that I and uh, several others were published um, uh, last year, um, uh, uh, working with Pfizer on the five to 11 year olds, and we're currently working on the under five year old children. And you can see here that over 3000 children were enrolled in this study. It included a primary study as well as a safety expansion study that was um, was requested by the FDA because of uh, additional safety uh, data that they wanted to collect. And overall on the right, you can see um, that this was um, actually a two to one randomization uh, study that of, of these over 3000 kids. And what we, the end point was symptomatic COVID infection. So it wasn't prospectively collecting swabs on asymptomatic kids. They had to have respiratory symptoms. So clearly there is some difference in the study than a prospectively done study to look just as shedding. But you can see there on the right that um, the number of cases um, in the two groups where there were three cases in the, uh, in the vaccine arm over the course of the study period and 16 cases in the placebo arm for a vaccine efficacy point estimate of 91% essentially with a very few serious adverse events um, in, in uh, both arms. And this I just wanted to show you is the results of our unblinding day, which was great news for the kids because they got to find out if they were vaccinated or not, or got placebo. Unfortunately, what we wound up finding is that um, uh, for the five to 11 year olds, we did great um, and the, the efficacy and safety were great. And for the under fives, we found out um, uh, early, uh, late uh, in fall of 2021 that the two dose series in kids under five, which was three micrograms per dose given three weeks apart, uh, which is one tenth of the adult dose actually did not provide uh, in, uh, a, a statistically significant antibody, antibody uh, uh, non-inferiority. And none of us in the study other than Pfizer executives and FDA know the data yet, even though I speak to Peter Marks on a regular basis, we were not appropriately not allowed to see the data. So we're all still blinded to the data. All we know is that the the not the efficacy, but the serial response was not, not was not non-inferior. So we are moving forward with a three-dose vaccine study. We're in the midst of doing that. We should be done within by the end of March, and we hope that the data on the three-dose series of three micrograms per dose will be done and sent, submitted to FDA by April. Now, when you look at data for Moderna, the data there are even less uh, clear for us because we have not. Again, even though we've been talking to uh, FDA and others, uh, the data really is just what you get from the media. This is from Politico. Um, and you can see the top line data that Moderna talked about over time is that last June, um, and Moderna did seek an EUA from the FDA for 12 to 17 year olds. But right after that was when we found out about myocarditis. And I did write a commentary for um, the, one of the first papers that came out looking at the, the case series of myocarditis. Um, after uh, a vaccination um, uh, with mRNA vaccines in, um, in older uh, adolescents. And by July, um, the, that's when the FDA requested five to 11 year old safety expansion data to look at adverse effects. By October, the company had announced a delay in the EUA for a lower dose, two dose regimen uh, for uh, six to 11 year olds until they had resolved the 12 to 17 year old EUA review, which is still pending. Um, and now we understand recently that Moderna will be testing 50 microgram doses for adolescents and 25 micrograms for younger children with data to be expected by the end of this first quarter um, in response to the safety concerns. And there's an extensive data on EU, UK, Australia, Canada, and other countries that have approved the vaccine for adolescents in a variety, with a variety of different conditions. And I, I can't really list them all here, but in some countries, they're really only for high-risk adolescents. In others, they're age-based within the broad bands of kids under 18. Now, what I want to focus on here is the issue of how we interpret data. And I know Monica and Peter are great at this, but here is how the messaging came out with these data from MMWR. And the data were that people who got infected 
had better protection against uh, infection, reinfection than people who were vaccinated. So this is the actual graph. Um, now, if you look at this, you would think that the, uh, in fact, the big blue line at the top um, is people who were vaccinated compared to those who were who had infection, and this would be reinfection rates. In fact, the line at the top are unvaccinated people who were infected over time, and the three little tiny lines at the bottom reflect um, uh, vaccinated with no previous COVID-19, unvaccinated with previous COVID, and vaccinated with previous COVID. And you can see that the um, vaccinated with no previous COVID um, is higher than the other two lines. So in fact, being vaccinated was a bit higher risk than being unvaccinated with previous infection or vaccinated with previous infection. But the point here is that unvaccinated people are still at so much higher risk of reinfection or prim primary infection or reinfection. So we really need to take a look carefully at how data are curated and what the top line messages are because we can get lost in the weeds. And here the point is that vaccines still work whether or not you were previously infected or not. Now, this study just came out recently and it's a New England Journal study, a prospective a cohort of healthcare workers in the UK looking at vaccine effectiveness uh, within 10 months after the first a vaccine dose, uh, uh, looking at infection of, uh, vaccine versus infection acquired community by comparing uh, routinely collected PCR samples from these populations. And there were about 35,000 participants um, with about a quarter of them having previous SARS-CoV-2 infection. And interestingly enough, SARS uh, vaccination coverage was very high, 97% of the participants with 92% of them being mRNA vaccines and 8% being the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. There were a total of about 2,700 primary infections and 210 reinfections. And here again, this is pre-Omicron, so this is December 2020 to September of 2021. But what you see here, and I've circled this on the table on the right, is that among previously uninfected and mRNA vaccinated participants, the vaccine effectiveness decreased from 85% uh, uh, within three months to 51% at a medium of about 200 days after the second dose. Interestingly enough, uh, the vaccine effectiveness was only about 58% for those who, who received the uh, AstraZeneca product compared to the 85% for the, for the mRNA product. But also more importantly, infection acquired immunity waned after one year in unvaccinated participants, but remained consistently higher than 90% in those who were subsequently vaccinated, even if in persons who were infected more than 18 months previously. So here at the bottom, you see that vaccinated with a second dose, the vaccine effectiveness is still over 90% um, more than 18 months previously. Now remember this is pre-Omicron, so uh, we don't have those data in this particular paper. So the point here is that infection acquired immunity did boost infection, uh, did boost immunity, uh, but, uh, but but it remained higher if you were boosted with vaccine as well. And there are many other studies, smaller studies that have demonstrated similar findings, but I thought this was a pretty powerful one. Now, more recently, uh, looking at children, um, there's a little bit of, I think, still some heartburn about these data because they're not peer reviewed. And I know that there's been some Twitter wars. I'm not myself on Twitter, but I've understood that there have been among uh, people in the field. But this is a study um, that is not yet uh, published. It's posted on MR, uh, Med Archives, and I think I put the link um, uh, on the next page. Um, uh, looking at Pfizer vaccine effectiveness against COVID and hospitalization in children 5 to 11 and 12 to 17. Now remember, 5 to 11 year olds got um, a 10 microgram dose and 12 to 17 year olds got a 30 microgram dose. And this was a linked database study of immunizations, lab tests, and hospitalization. And so this was important because it was an Omicron study from December of 2021 to this past January among uh, over 800,000 12 to 17 year olds and over 350,000 5 to 11 year olds. And what, we, what was found was at least inferred through the, the database analysis, vaccine effectiveness was uh, declined from 66 to 51% for those 12 to 17 and from 68% to 12% to, for, for 5 to 11 year olds. This was infection. However, hospitalization um, did was more robust and but, but did decline 
from 85 to 73% for the older kids and from 100% to 48% for the five to 11 year olds. Um, and so we do see that um, the effectiveness did decline rapidly, at least in this study. Now, again, we need peer review data to look at the databases a little more carefully, um, but vaccines were protective and still are recommended. And this does re uh, highlight the potential need, Not no, we don't know yet, the potential need to study alternative vaccine dosing for kids. As you know, we're already doing that for the two mRNA vaccines um, uh, now and the continued importance of protections if there are people at high risk. And I did post some FAQs on the American Academy of Pediatrics website yesterday under the healthychildren.org section for parents who want to uh, understand questions about masking in this post mandate era and to make sure people feel that they can at least understand their own risks and benefits. As you heard before, perception is critical. Now, here's a slide from uh, that study that I just mentioned to you. And there's the, uh, the, the reference at the bottom. And I just wanted to point out two things to you. And now granted within the limits of these large databases and linking databases, you can see that at the top, the arrow shows that the vaccine effectiveness over time was highest in the 12 year olds and was lowest in the five to 11 year olds. And um, the 12 year olds, it was pointed out in the paper, actually are the smallest, uh, the youngest age that gets the highest adult dose. So the question was raised and we don't know the answer yet, whether or not this means that, um, that the dose amount by weight may be important. Certainly that may play a role. Um, clearly we're studying whether more doses are helpful, but it is an intriguing um, possibility. Now, let me talk briefly about boosters and vaccine safety. These are data from the ACIP and I put the links below there. Um, this is from the uh, Vaccine Safety Technical Work Group um, and VAST reviewed in January, the most recent data from the three US safety monitoring systems, um, VAERS and VSD included, as well from international partners. And we saw that rates of myocarditis and pericarditis are higher than background. I'll show you what they are in a bit and highest after dose two in adolescent and young adult males. And the risk appears higher after dose two of Moderna than of dose two Pfizer. Um, and uh, interval data will be interesting and I'll show you that in a bit. Now the risk of myocarditis, as I said, was highest after the second dose among young males, especially for Moderna compared to Pfizer. And the risk would seem to be lower with extended intervals between first and second dose of mRNA. And I remember Monica quite clearly talking about this earlier uh, last year, but I think one of the issues that we need to talk about too uh, as we go forward is that we need to accumulate data and have time to really insert the data uh, into existing ongoing clinical trials, which I think we have done now in January of this year. So these are data from Canada. It's really interesting because I work with the Canadian Pediatric Society and one of the reasons they really did this study was because at the beginning of the pandemic, they didn't have access to a lot of vaccine. So they, and they also do their vaccinations regionally. So each region and province decides on their own uh, type of vaccine and their own interval scheduling. And what they, was done here was to try to uh, um, actually maximize the amount of vaccine they could give out is some place, some provinces used one vaccine or another based on what they got but also extended the interval so they could vaccinate more people with first doses. So the idea here was really to look at what the interval, uh, the, the interval impact was on vaccine effectiveness. And you see that the interval impact, um, but, but then they found, uh, and I'll show you that data in a bit, but what they did find is a secondary byproduct. They weren't looking at this initially. Remember, we didn't know about myocarditis, was that the risk of myocarditis was higher um, in the earlier days, if you, if you gave shorter intervals and at by eight weeks, the risk seemed to be at a, 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 at a nadir uh, in terms of intervals. And in addition, when they, this was the primary outcome here was vaccine effectiveness. And you see, when you look at two different provinces, you see that the effectiveness of the vaccines um, really were uh, really peaked out at about seven to eight week intervals between the two doses and didn't seem to go up after that. So these were helpful data. There were also data from the UK um, that I don't have time to show you. So basically um, the CDC and ACIP and others uh, concluded that the extended primary in series interval may improve immunogenicity and effectiveness. 
with antibody responses higher after an extended interval um, and um, may also um, actually prevent uh, risk for myocarditis. And so those are the recommendations now is to consider uh, longer intervals uh, for um, people uh, over 12 years of age, especially males between 12 and 39 years of age. Now this is safety data on boosters and very quickly just to show you these, uh, this is Moderna on the left and Pfizer on the right. And the blue, the dark blue is uh, dose one, the light middle blue is dose two and the booster is the very light blue. And you can see over time that the booster dose has very similar uh, uh, reactogenicity compared to uh, the first and second doses because there was some concern that boosters might cause more uh, systemic reactions. Now, uh, in addition to that, the similar, this particular study also looked at reporting of over almost 40,000 adverse events, the vast majority of which were mild and included 37 cases of myocarditis. The table is incorrect there for some reason, it says 36, but the text says 37 cases and they were highest in men aged 18 to 24 years of age. One person with myocarditis did die in ongoing investigation of that case is, uh, has not been reported yet. Now, um, in addition, there was another study looking at vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 associated emergency department and urgent care visits um, in adults. Um, and this demonstrated that um, uh, that uh, hospitalization, uh, I'm sorry, effectiveness decreased over time. Uh, but uh, so uh, they were the, the rates of visits were effectiveness uh, uh, was 87 and 90% during the two months after a third, third dose um, and decreased to 66 and 78% by the fourth month after a third dose. So we're still seeing some reductions, but still pretty hardy. Uh, protection against visits to EDs and um, urgent and urgent care centers. Um, and then again, one other study looking at pediatric data um, that was just released recently, looking at, um, we don't have data on vaccine effectiveness during Omicron uh, among children five to 11 years of age. And in this analysis, it was found that two doses protected against COVID-19 uh, emergency departments and um, urgent care visits among uh, young children and adolescents. However, the vaccine effectiveness was lower during Omicron pred predominance and decreased with time since vaccination with a booster restoring effectiveness to 81% among adolescents aged 16 to 17 years of age. So overall, the two dose vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 associated hospitalizations was fairly robust at 73 to 94%. Um, and you can see here um, that, uh, again, the, the takeaway is that the younger children had, um, the, among adolescents, the vaccine effectiveness was better and lasted uh, and was higher after, uh, uh, after about three, three to four months than compared to the five to 11 year olds. But in the older children where boosters are allowed uh, the booster did increase um, uh, increase vaccine effectiveness over time. And then finally, I just want to talk about risk of myocarditis in, in raw numbers. So the uh, CDC uh, has calculated that risk. And you see here on the left for Moderna, the risk of myocarditis is about 62 per excess cases of myocarditis per million doses in males, um, especially those 18 to 39 and 6.2 per million um, in females, 18 to 39. And on the right, you see the Pfizer data. Um, and here you see, you can actually, because uh, only Pfizer is indicated for those um, um, under 18, uh, the data can be expanded down to the 16 year olds. And you see here on the left of that Pfizer slide, the prevention of uh, hospitalizations in light blue and ICU admissions in dark blue relative to the number of cases of myocarditis uh, per million doses. So you see the risk again, be around, um, again, it's in similarly about six dozen cases at the highest risk in 16 to 17 year olds per million, uh, per million doses given. And this is an infographic from the Infectious Disease Society of America that for uh, the public to understand what the risk of myocarditis is, because it is quite low. It's um, in that age group of young males, 12 to 29, it's one in 14,000. And I won't, I don't have time to talk about it, but the clinical manifestations of myocarditis in this age group are very distinct from COVID related 
or other cardiac manifestations, which you already spoke about. And we're seeing that those are very disturbing longer term consequences of actual COVID infection in the cardiovascular system. So um, I'll, I'll uh, just end by saying that boosters and second generation vaccines are being developed now. We're seeing that Moderna, Pfizer, and others are looking at uh, either uh, bivalent or other um, a combination um, uh, booster studies, but we don't have data to share at this point. So the point is, what do we do next? We get vaccinated, we get boosted, follow the news and the science as it evolves. You are all doing a great job here. Um, and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Bonnie. We've got a few minutes left, maybe we go over a minute or two. Um, where do things stand now with uh, with a second booster being recommended for adults? Uh, we've you discussed the waning efficacy, uh, but uh, I know there have been some studies that have come out have been somewhat conflicting. Where where do you think this is landing? Yeah, you know, it's really not easy to find a consistent message there. I think there are a lot of opinions, but in terms of hard data, a lot of it is extrapolated from laboratory studies looking at um, T and B cell responses over time. Um, the best data really does come from Israel, although um, it's not really, it's not fully mature yet, but it does appear that um, a fourth dose may not be um, uh, effective within a short window after the third dose yet. And um, so we don't really know when a fourth dose may be helpful. Um, in general, if you talk to immunologists, I'm not an immunologist, they tend to think that you want to space these doses apart pretty far, pretty far. So giving another booster at this point might be immunologically and epidemiologically not the best thing to do, particularly since we're at, you, as you had already talked about, that sweet spot of having the Omicron surge start to try, start to slow down. Okay. Uh, one of our viewers asked, uh, the, can you explain why the three microgram dose was used as, and, and, and is it possible that, that they just got that wrong and we should be looking at different doses? Well, a great point, but I can tell you that doing randomized controlled trials is, you know, takes a lot of time. <laughs> and uh, we've been working really hard to enroll. We're actually one of the top enrollers in the country here because Californians really want to get their kids vaccinated. So it was easy to find actually thousands of people who wanted to enroll their kids in the study, although we were only allowed, a, you know, two to 300 kids. The point is that what the phase one studies were done, as you all know, phase ones are generally done in a couple dozen people. And the risk um, of giving uh, in the five to 11 year olds, giving them the adult dose actually re resulted in, uh, in uh, higher fevers in, the, in that age group. And when you're talking about 20, 30, 40 kids, and you know, even if five to 10% of them have higher fevers, that is over 104, that can translate into a lot of hospital visits, a lot of spinal taps, et cetera. So uh, that was the reason for dropping from 30 to 10 for the five to 11s. Similarly, what we found, and we saw this in our own cohorts, when we were giving the, the 10 microgram dose, we really couldn't progress. It was very clear that 10 micrograms in those little kids was too high a dose. Now, whether you can quibble about whether we should have started with three or five, and I have no idea why the company picked three, uh, but that's what they settled on. And it is possible, and I guess if I were working at Pfizer that I might think, and Moderna, that I might think about upping the dose a bit, or it may be that three doses works better than two. I'll remind everybody here who's not a pediatrician that of the 17 vaccines routinely recommended for kids right now that are not COVID vaccines, most of them require three to five doses for full effectiveness. So I think, you know, more doses rather than higher, um, do, higher antigen or higher mRNA concentration may be the answer. But and it's really you, a mix and match right yeah, now. Yeah, you said you're not privy to what's going on behind the curtain, but what's your guess? Do you think that's going to, the zero to five is going to turn out to be okay with three doses? You know, I, I think uh, it's not going to be perfect. I, I can tell you that. I, I do think that three doses uh, may actually get us, get us there. And the reason I think that is two things. One is we looked at the data and actually you discussed this with FDA. Um, the six month old, the six to 23 months old did, did fine with the dose. The, it was the two to four year olds. And the second issue is the way they calculated non-inferiority was extremely stringent, more stringent than you use for any other vaccine. So I think they failed because the stringency of the non-inferiority calculations were too high. Mm -hmm. So I do think three doses will probably work. Um, but again, we'll, everybody's, you know, these are cold viruses. There's a reason we keep getting infected. You're, we're going to need boosters at some point. The question is when. And 
as you look at the that incredibly low uptake in five to 11 year olds, is do you think that's just a case of a victim? Uh, we've been victims of misinformation that that the that the, uh, the myocarditis was, was sort of overemphasized compared to what the real risks are and the benefits of the vaccine underemphasized. I think it's both. I think we don't, uh, you know, when three quarters of the people who are hospitalized and die are older and children seem to weather this pretty well, that message came across loud and clear. And it's actually true. It looks like children do have, you know, per population on the pop, you know, per hundred thousand lower hospitalization rates. Um, the problem is that we are risk. It's all again about risk perception. I think even the data from Kaiser Family Foundation clearly show that even fully vaccinated parents and boosted parents will not vaccinate their kids. They just don't see the risk there. And so you have this binary where there are families who are terrified to let their kids out. And there are others who just think they don't need it. And this is just a cold for the children. The problem is that we, you know, who run pediatric facilities have seen kids on ventilators and on ECMO with no underlying conditions. It's true that underlying conditions are a predictor, but it's not every child. And the other issue is that only 20,000 children under 18 die a year before COVID. So when the numbers are so low, proportionately, I think people tend to discount it. But if you can prevent, uh, why do we buckle up our kids or why do we put helmets on them? It's the same kind of risk calculation. Yeah. Maybe last question. You made the point that the that the hybrid immunity, if you get infection and vaccination, uh, there's 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 value there. That seems to work quite well. Do you believe that for the kids and maybe for the adults as well, if you have infection, a single shot's going to be enough? And also, does it matter whether you get the infection before your vaccine or after your vaccine? Well, it's interesting. I'll, I'll answer the second one first. It appears that it um, it may not matter. In some studies, it does didn't matter whether you were infected first or, or vaccinated first. You still had a really good boost. Um, and I do think that, you know, we're still looking at T and B cell studies. We just uh, had a paper published in CID um, looking at uh, IGRA. Uh, so T cell responses, immune uh, interferon gamma release assay responses 10 months and in adults, 10 months after um, infection, natural infection. And this was from very early on, from even before alpha. And we found that the uh, IGRA responses really dropped off after 10 months. So where it looks like even T cell responses may start to drop off. And so I think that we may be in a situation where we may need an annual booster or maybe a, bi a biannual booster. Really depends not only on whether we have continuous circulation of this virus, but also on how uh, how virulent it is and um, how well we're, uh, it's able to adapt to become uh, less uh, more, of a, more of a nuisance than a, a real threat. But for the parents that you said almost 60 percent of kids have gotten infected, if, if you knew your kid had gotten infected, would you then be comfortable with a single shot? No, I would actually want my kid to get both because, you know, there is, as you know, there's a prime boost effect. You can't just get one shot and expect it to work the same as the second. You, most of us know from looking at other vaccine trials that the second dose does provide additional uh, stimulation of not only primary and memory B cells, but also T cells. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, we should let you and everyone else go. Thank you so much. It was really terrific. Thanks for all your leadership in this area. Uh, for those of you that have been uh, watching, we'll be back to a non-COVID Grand Rounds next week. And again, if you're following us for COVID, a month from now, uh, April 7th, we'll have um, uh, Caitlin Rivers and Zeke Emanuel. Uh, stay well. We'll talk to you next week.